And it doesn't look like we have anyone on the phone at the moment. So folks should be able to see the chat. Um, and um, sender is spelled S-U-E. So I think we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and call to order the Transportation, Energy, and Utilities Committee of the City Council. It's five ten p.m. Um, and we've got two of the three committee members here, and I've let Councillor Stromberg know that we've started, but she is under the weather, so I'm not sure that she'll make it. Um, so I will go to Councillor Barlow for um, a motion on our agenda for tonight. So I move we uh, approve the agenda. Okay, I'll second that. Any discussion of the agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, so we have our agenda. And next item on the agenda is approval of the minutes from last meeting. Um, would you like to, well, I guess I'll make the motion since you weren't there, um, <laughs> Councillor Barlow. Um, but hopefully you can, even though you weren't there, you can vote on it too, because otherwise it won't be approved. Um, so I'll move the minutes from last meeting. Um, is there a second? No, I'll second that. Okay, any discussion on the minutes? Um, and you had emailed me, Councillor Barlow, was, did we have a recording from last meeting, a video recording? Yes, and I've, uh, I've actually watched about half of it. So. Oh, great, okay, okay, great. All right, um, let's go to a vote on the minutes. All those in favor of approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Okay, we've approved the minutes from last meeting. And the next item is public forum. Um, do we, did anyone email in advance looking to speak, um, Maddie or, or Chapa? Nope, no, no one emailed in advance looking to speak. Okay, great. I see two folks um, in the attendees looking to speak, so we'll go to them. And if anyone wants to speak, just use the raise hand function, or if that's not working, um, you can um, just type in the chat that you're looking to speak. Um, so I first saw Wendy Co, which is which is Jean Bergman. Um, Jean, are you able to unmute and speak? We might need to. We might need to give Gene permission. Okay, I see. I see. There we go. You got Great. me. Perfect. Yes. Okay. Uh, thank you. Um, and uh, I, I've spoken many times in favor of municipal consolidated um, co uh, municipal consolidated collection system and only Councillor Barlow you have not been able to hear my recent so I'm going to summarize basic points and if uh, need be would love the chance to be able to weigh in during the discussion um, solid waste collection and management is a public need and essential public good Consolidated collections important in our fight against climate change since it reduces the redundancy in the trip collection of collection trips. It's also more efficient economically. But while I support a consolidated cons collection system, consolidation creates monopoly conditions. And so a public system, a municipal system, is more in the public interest than a private monopoly system. And that's because it keeps democratic and economic control in the hands of the public. It means greater control over rates since rates are based on what it'll take to run the, the program. It allows us to be more flexible, to adjust to changing waste stream conditions. And it builds, and I think this is very significant, it builds a significant number of new union jobs. Uh, and it, that, therefore it strengthens the region's middle class. More privatization of public services is not in the public interest, which is what franchising a consolidated system would do since the current recycling program would be eliminated and turned over to the private sector. The biggest advantage of privatization is that it has a supposed cost effectiveness, providing the same level of service at a substantially lower uh, cost, but DPW's analysis, at least what I saw um, at the DPW commission last week um, shows that that's just not true in this case. 
the franchise model also accepts that there is going to be a cost for monitoring enforcement, but these costs have not been factored in. So the cost to the franchise model to residents is really lowballed. The a municipal program provides other benefits. It can help us purchase the Flint Avenue facility for a drop-off center. We could recapture lost revenue from the opt-outs. Um, if we allow opt-outs, if we had a drop-off center in addition to getting the, the revenues from the municipal system, it would also add capacity to DPW by adding staff that could be used in other capacities. Um, and Finally, it would contribute to the city's economic health through the payment of indirect costs for attorneys and HR functions. Those are democratic and public uses of the revenues that are gonna be generated. So I, I really hope if you're going to act tonight that you will support a consolidated municipal solid waste system. Um, I have left out a lot as Chapin has suffered through that. Um, so <laughs> he's shaking his head, but um, would love to be able to uh, uh, to weigh in on particulars if uh, if need be. Thank you very much. All right, great, thanks, Gene. Um, I see um, Tiki, Tiki Arshambo. Um, would you like to unmute and speak? And then we'll have Cameron Scott next. Sure, yeah, just checking in to see if you all can hear me right now or not. Yeah. Oh, great, all right. Great, thank you very much. Uh, yeah, so so my name's Tiki, I'm on the um, Public Works Commission. We did just speak to this issue here and I, I felt compelled to um, join the meeting a little bit similar to what Gene was just expressing. I, I did see some of the communication uh, from staff, which seemed to suggest maybe that the um, owning this at the municipal level was just really not a feasible way to go. And I, I did express concerns about that in my meeting. Uh, effectively, but the, you have two paths here, right? I, you have, for consolidated collection, I'm a big supporter, so I get it. You could argue for or against, and I'm sure you're gonna hear a lot of that. For my purposes, I am a supporter of it. The two paths within that are to keep it municipal or to uh, send it out to private contractors to be able to manage that. So those are the, that's the reality of it. Uh, in, in looking this and thinking it through from a public commissioner standpoint, uh, I do support the municipal ownership, despite the, um, uh, what do you want to say, the, the, the different focus it will introduce to the department. Uh, so it, you know, I recognize that Chapin has a lot on his plate. And this introduces yet one more priority to manage. So it's something to consider is maybe it, is that manageable under the public works or is that another department? Uh, I'm not sure what the right answer to that is. Nonetheless, uh, the municipal path does allow for more equity. And when I say that, I, I'm imagining a situation of hiring haulers, right? Who are gonna come along and pick up our trash. Those haulers are gonna earn whatever the, the floating rate might be, minimum wage or the living wage in Burlington. And even at 15 or 20 bucks an hour, you, th those folks are still gonna struggle. Whereas were this a municipal job, we could allow them to earn a bit more salary and, and kind of make a career of this, right? Uh, rotate through, drive the trucks, uh, haul the cans, maybe work at the facility. There's so much to do around this project. They could also rely on a pension thereafter. So uh, that's partly why I look at this as an equity issue more than anything to keep it municipal. And um, I certainly don't intend to speak for the commission myself. I don't speak for the department, I'm just speaking from on my own behalf here. So those are some of the thoughts that crossed my mind as we uh, explored this in the Public Works Commission. And uh, I just wanted to be sure to share that with you all on the TUC. So thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you, Tiki, appreciate that. Um, and I will now go to Cameron Scott. And if others wanna speak, just as I said, um, feel free, just raise your hand or indicate in the chat and then we'll call on you to speak. Um, Cameron, you wanna go ahead? Hi, can you hear me? Great. Yes. All right, I have a lot of thoughts I'd like to share but I'll try to make it as brief as possible. Um, I'm Cameron Scott. I started No Waste Compost, which is a local compost uh, pickup service specifically for households. Um, 
So I, I am directly my business and uh, my career is entirely affected by this consolidation. Um, so I am here today to voice my support for consolidating and specifically the municipal option. Um, I, I'm going to try not to just echo some of the other statements that have been made. I do have concerns about the franchise monopolization possibility. And um, it, I, I also a concern about the additional costs that aren't being conser- considered, especially potential lawsuits going in that route. Um, and I can say that as somebody who would be on the other side of the table on those lawsuits. Um, so I, I certainly think the municipal option is best, even though it appears like the more expensive option at this time, I think in the long run, it, it will prove to be the right way to go. And I think the political process of trying to contract out and, and put bids on different areas in order to avoid a monopoly is it's too convoluted. It's going to be too complex. Um, so I highly recommend avoiding going down that route. Um, regarding the difficulty of the department's managing such a a facility and operations i believe that's something the city can take on now i have no experience working for the city but knowing the operations of a waste management business i think it's actually easier for a municipality to do um that's my take on it and is definitely the route that should be considered now i'm saying that as somebody who will lose Um, about 80% of my business if consolidation happens. Um, So I say that (laughs) truly meaning that I believe it is for the benefit of our residents and and the greater community that we move in that direction. And on top of that, I'd like to express slight frustration that um, we didn't move in the direction of consolidating composting when we had the opportunity to get ahead of that. I had a opportunity and a plan that I presented uh, many years ago that was a a zero cost way for the city to move towards consolidated composting, which could have been a bridge to consolidating these other services. It would have made the process much simpler and we'd already have a blueprint um, in ways of how to make such a transition because of course we know we have Burlington Recycling. It's really the transitions that are the larger tasks to accomplish. So I I'm frustrated that it's taken so long um, for us to make these decisions. And I, I wanted to express something that I don't think is being considered is that most of the companies, such as mine, we have not been making the investments into new infrastructure, new technologies, new employees to create more efficient services in the Burlington and South Burlington areas. The reason being, is, as you can see from these plans, these are millions of dollars of investments to, to really provide, you know, a three bay truck picking up compost, trash, recycling all at once. So had we made these decisions, but be it a yes or no, even years ago, I believe that companies would have already invested in these technologies. The reason they aren't is because how can anyone justify investing in a market that's about to disappear? Um, so I highly urge the committee to to take a true action tonight, um, make a final decision and, and move forward on that. And my support is for the municipal option. Even though my business would disappear, I, I believe this is what's best for Vermont. All right, thanks. Great, thank you, Cameron. Um, is anyone else looking to speak during this public forum? Mm-hmm. Okay, not seeing anyone. Um, we will, we, we do typically, and I will allow people to speak um, during, during items as well, if they want to do that. So you may have another opportunity if you're going to speak to an item that we're discussing. Um, but that being said, I'm going to go ahead and close the public forum and we will move to um, agenda. Item number four, the I-89 corridor study update. Um, And we have Nicole Loesch presenting from DPW. Um, The floor is yours when you're ready, Nicole. 
Thank you. And Maddie, thanks for promoting our partners from the CCRPC as well. I'll just do a very brief introduction. Um, I have been, I'm Nicole Loesch. I'm the senior planner in DPW, and I've been serving as Burlington's representative on the advisory committee and the technical committee for the I-89 study, which is being led by the CCRPC. And so I will turn this over to Eleni, um, who will actually run the presentation. And um, if you'd like to do any introductions for you or the rest of your team, um, but thank you for being here tonight and um, take it away. It looks okay. unmute, unmute answer. Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. All right. Well, thank you for inviting us. And I'm here today with, well, my name is Eleni Churchill. I'm a transportation program manager at the CCRPC. I'm also the Program a project manager for the ID9 study. And I'm here today with Jason Charest as well as Charlie's here. Charlie is executive director of the RPC, and they, I'm going to let them introduce themselves in a second. And once uh, we introduce ourselves, I will start the presentation. I will try to just see if I can share my screen. And then we'll tag team with Jason on the presentation. So, Jason, you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Lenny. Hi, everyone. I'm Jason Charest, uh, Senior Transportation Planning Engineer with the CCRPC and support staff on the IE9 project. And Charlie Baker here uh, just to help support, answer any questions I can. Thanks. Thank you. So let me just try and see if this works. Uh, okay. Let's see. Can you see the presentation? Yes. Okay, great. So, um, so we are here to give you a brief update on where we are with the ID9 2050 study. And we're going to start with the project uh, uh, background and overview. Uh, and then Jason is going to go over the interchange concepts um, as well as the scoring. And, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about the recommendations to date. And uh, we are trying very hard at this. So we are kind of in between phases in this study. So we have done a lot of work on the interchanges. We have done two, two uh, rounds of evaluations. And we are now ready to actually make final decisions of which interchanges uh, improvements are going to move further into further study in the corridor bundles. And I'm going to explain all that, uh, you know, a little further down in the presentation. Uh, but we are trying to just shift a conversation now to look at the entire corridor that is going to include a lot more than just interchanges uh, as improvements to this corridor. And then we're going to finish with next steps. Um, just to take us a step back, uh, this uh, the genesis of this study actually was, where, you know, uh, it was way back when we were doing our, our ECOS uh, uh, MTP, Metropolitan Transportation Plan. That's that's our long range regional plan. And uh, I'm just going to just go over some of the priorities that we had in that plan. So 70 percent uh, and our plan was uh, the, the future year of the plan was 2050. Uh, some of the priorities was that 70% of the funding that we're going to get in the county between now and 2050 is going to go to maintaining, maintaining the system that we have. Uh, we also are, uh, we have a land use component in the plan that basically is looking to have 90% of the household growth in our villages and downtowns. And that's very important because in order to promote and you know, improve and increase our biking and walking and transit and all the things that we want to do, we need to have uh, more growth in our villages and downtowns. We need density. Um, we also have, uh, we address a lot of safety, uh, uh, you know, uh, that we have, especially in our inter in intersections uh, and where there are high crash locations. HCL stands for high crash locations. Uh, we also invested in TDM programs and TDM programs, it's, uh, you know, transportation demand management. And this is, they might include park and rides, carpool, van pools, uh, car sharing. It's just basically ways and programs to manage 
our uh, travel, especially during peak hours. Uh, in, in our MTP, we have uh, substantial uh, increases in transit services from what we have today, as well as improvements and, and investments in walking and biking. And ITS stands from Intelligent Transportation Systems, and this basically, you can think of smart signals and uh, maybe a variable message signs to alert you for some issues up ahead. Um, so you cannot just take, take alternative routes. And then in our MTP, we basically have capacity expansion, and this is roadway capacity expansion only when we need it. So having said that, when we run our model and we have a regional transportation model for the county, um, it's that it looks at traffic mainly. Uh, when we run the model for 2050, and granted the assumptions that we, we have in that model, it's a pre-COVID and pre-pandemic, and we need to monitor conditions afterwards to see how things go. But that model indicated that there was an issue with our ID9. And um, the issue was, especially between exit 14 and 15, uh, is there was a, a, that specific segment of the interstate was over capacity in 2050, which means that there was, uh, you know, there was gridlock. There was no uh, movement of vehicles. So you had more cars than space. So that's an issue that we needed to basically investigate and, uh, and address in this study. And that's what we're doing with this study. There was also some other issues with the exit 14. Uh, we all know that there are delays in exit 14, as well as a lot of other issues like bike and pet connectivity and safety and all that. Uh, so we wanted to take a closer look at all the entire, uh, you know, like uh, interstate as well as the interchanges in Chinon County. I just also want to just uh, uh, just briefly mention some of the outcomes of the MTP with all the investments that we did for bike and pet transit, the TDM, all that stuff. We had some, um, you know, some uh, good results. Uh, even though we, you know, we definitely need to work a little harder on that, but we have some decrease in VMT as well as VHT, vehicles hours of travel. We have increase in the uh, non-auto mode share from 12 to 16. And then in order to meet our state and regional energy goals, we also, uh, you know, we have a goal of having 90% of the fleet. And when I say fleet, I mean, uh, passenger vehicles and light trucks, 90% uh, of that should be electric vehicles by 2050. And that basically gives us 77% reduction in fuel consumption between the 2015, which was the base, and the 2050, which was the future. So just this a little bit uh, background on our MTP and how we came up about to do the, uh, the ID9 study. And the ID9 study uh, includes the entire interstate in Chinon County, there's 37 miles, seven interchanges, as well as the arterials that they are adjacent to those interchanges. And you can see them in the little uh, boxes on the on the upper uh, right there. Um, where we are in the process, so this slide basically provides like all the major tasks in this study. Where we're now in this, the dotted line, I'm not quite sure, do you guys see my cursor? Yeah. No. No. Okay. I won't use it then. Um, I do. I do see it. Do you see it, Jack? Okay. Yeah. 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 I think we all we all see it. All right. You can see it. Okay. It's you know sometimes it's a mystery if you can or not. Uh, now so, I don't. But I did. Now I do. Now I do. Okay. Uh, maybe I think maybe when I'm moving it, you see it. Yeah. I think we yeah. do. I see people uh, nodding. Okay. Great. So um, right now we are actually trying to just, we are kind of like right here in between task four and task five. We have done a lot of uh, um, evaluation of interchanges, new and, and upgraded interchanges uh, that I'm, we're gonna go through in a second. And we are about hopefully uh, this um, in May, we're gonna have an advisory committee, not hopefully, we will have an advisory committee meeting in May I believe it's May 19th. And then we're gonna uh, report all our findings as well as all our input that we received from um, the South, South Burlington City Council, other stakeholders. 
uh, on, the, on the interchange question, and then hopefully we'll be able to move forward to look at the much more comprehensive multimodal package of improvements for the I-89 under task five. Uh, I just want to just mention that we have developed a vision and goal for this, and we spend a lot of time with our committees, both the, the advisory committee and the technical committee, as well as a number of groups, uh, you know, like wordsmithing this. And as you can see, we're looking, we are actually, our goal is for uh, to have a safe, resilient uh, interstate that provides for reliable and efficient movement of people and goods. But the important thing is that, um, and that last last sentence says that we we want to do that, and we want to just develop uh, a, a corridor. Basically, supports our goals as a region, a state, and and, and as municipalities, as well as our uh, you know plans that we have uh, for our communities. We have six goals under the vision. You can see them there, uh, ranging from safety. Uh, we are looking at livable communities. We're looking at the mobility and efficiency uh, for all users, not just vehicles. So we are looking at uh, uh, connectivity of bike and pedestrians through the interchanges. Uh, we are also looking at environmental stewardship and the resilience of our corridor. Uh, economic access um, is also important for us and the vitality of our region. Uh, it's it's important. And uh, uh, one major item that we will be spending a lot more attention when we're looking at the corridor versus the interchanges is the system preservation. Our, our um, uh, interstate is getting old and it's getting to the point that it might need some major reconstruction, at least parts of it. And in Chin and County, in the urban core of the county, we have the most traffic in, in, in you know, at least we had the most traffic pre-pandemic, uh, and we need to monitor to see if that will return or not. So uh, that's the vision and goals. I did mention the two rounds of the interchange evaluation. Um, as you can see, the first round, uh, we had a lot of fun with eight interchanges. Uh, we evaluated, uh, we, we, we say it was a high level, but it was actually a pretty detailed evaluation that we did for those eight interchanges. And from those, we chose three locations and we had five concepts on those locations. So the locations that came out of the, the first round to move forward for further evaluation in the second round was at exit, at, it's, this is a new exit. So this is an exit at 12B and this is at the um, Heinsberg Road overpass uh, in South Burlington. Uh, exit 13, we have two concepts, and Jason is going to go over them in a second. And exit 14 have, again, two concepts uh, that we're going to go over, uh, you know, in a few minutes. Uh, we added this slide here because there was some confusion of what this study um, was going to accomplish. Uh, so we want to make sure that everybody understands that there are uh, probably three different kinds of recommendations and outputs that kind of come out of the study. The first one would be minor capital improvements and investments. And those are the things like that can be done in the short term. Um, uh, shared use paths, sidewalks, crosswalks are something that the municipalities and veterans can move forward um, without a lot of process. I mean, uh, always when you're using federal funds, you have a lot of process, but uh, this is something that can be done in the short and medium term. Um, operational investments, uh, mainly here we're talking about transit services, but also some TDM programs that can be done under those. And then we have the major capital investments. We're talking about like a capacity, roadway capacity investments here, interchanges, or an ID9 uh, project like a, a, a third lane on the interstate, let's say. Um, those investments are very long term. And, uh, you know, they, they will be, we will be using federal funding for that. And uh, these projects and this, uh, well, these investments will go through a, a very rigorous NEPA process and they may require environmental impact statement. And I say may because it depends if it's an existing interchange versus a new, it might be uh, something, you know, a, a different under NEPA. But there is going to be a lot of process, a, a lot of uh, analysis again, uh, a lot of uh, concepts to be evaluated again, uh, but also a lot of input from the communities then. 
And uh, these investments are not going to be short term. These are very long term investments. I don't want to put a, a year, a number of years or anything like that, but it, it's it's definitely going to be like 15, 20 years into the into the future. There, I put the number too. Uh, so, and then I'm just going to point you down to the very last statement there in blue. And that is, um, we are recognizing that there are a lot of uncertainties in the world uh, and, uh, you know, definitely on the transportation side of things. We don't know post-pandemic, What's going to happen with the travel? We don't know how people will travel. Uh, the other, we don't know how the telecommuting is going to continue or not. So what we are proposing to do is that we are proposing to develop triggers that is going to tell us when an investment, and we're talking about the major capacity investments here, uh, you know, when an investment is needed because we do not want to spend money and effort in investments that they are not needed. So we're going to develop, we're going to have monitor of conditions, especially traffic. We haven't developed the measures yet, but we, we will be developing the measures uh, under task six. And uh, uh, then uh, we're just going to basically uh, have the trigger. When you meet the trigger, then, uh, you know, you move forward to actually uh, uh, with that investment. Um, and this is, again, in recognition of the uncertain times that we live in. Uh, and now I'm going to just hand it over to Jason to, you know, talk about the interchange concept plans. Oops, sorry. Did it go through? No. Yeah. That's great. Okay. Started with 12B. Go for it, Jason. Thanks, Eleni. Okay, we'll, we'll start um, towards the south uh, at 12B, which would be, you know, a new interchange at... Um, the bridges that go over uh, 116 or, or Heinsberg Road. And what you're, the colors you're looking at in the, back, in the background, that's just from our, our ECOS plan, and those are our, uh, designated um, areas that we have. Um, and the, all the colors aside from green, which is rural, are areas uh, planned for growth. So just so you understand kind of what's, what's behind that map. So this is what it, what it would look like. Um, 116 goes uh, north to south. Uh, it would, would need to be widened. Uh, there'd be a new bridge that would be about four lanes wide. Uh, the bridge would have you know, a sidewalk on one side and a multi-use path on the other. Um, that's just that's what we're showing right now that could that could change if this you know moved forward in the future. Um, there would be the three new um, either signal or roundabout on 116. Thanks, Eleni. Um, the northbound on and off ramps themselves would, would actually intersect with Tilly Drive. So Eleni's showing those there, and that would be another either signal or roundabout. So kind of four, four new either signals or roundabouts as a result of of this um, this interchange, and you were just showing the other things that we're just showing on this map are the other um, future proposed connections in South Burlington. So you can see the black uh, dotted line. That's a one connection, and then the other connection is extending Tilly Drive over to uh, Community Drive. That's on the, the right side or the easterly side of the screen. Moving, moving, uh, well, it's technically north on the interstate, I suppose, but more, more like west in this location, over to exit 13. Oh, sorry. There you go. There we go. The first one we're talking about here is the U-turn or the hybrid option is what we're calling it. And that would, uh, the main feature would consist of a U-turn ramp that would go from the uh, westbound side of 189 to the eastbound side. And along with a couple of new ramps, the northbound off-ramp, excuse me, that's... Sorry. <laughs> northbound off-ramp and then the northbound on-ramp that would 
in effect make this a full interchange, which it is um, not today, as, as many of you are, are no doubt aware of. Uh, the other thing I want to make mention here is we've shown in in the yellow dotted line is a new shared use path that would go over the interstate. So it'd be a new bicycle pedestrian connection that could have the potential to then link up with um, another proposed path on Spear Street. And then that could maybe someday continue um, westerly over to, over to Route 7. This is the single point diamond interchange or SPDI for short. And starting on the Western side or the, the left of your screen for those directionally challenged like myself. Um, this is a rather much, much larger um, construction scale um, new or change to this interchange compared to what you previously saw. So this would actually kind of decommission the existing eastbound um, side of 189 and move it so that is it is uh, directly adjacent to the westbound side and would kind of convert this to a more of a boulevard style roadway kind of similar to what you would encounter on Kennedy Drive today and so it would it would lose its um, interchange or excuse me interstate designation and um, mainly because there's a, a signal on it thanks for zooming out Lenny and then this is, you know, what it would look like itself. And the main features are that it would or kind of re reduce greatly the number of um, assets that need to be maintained. There's, you know, two bridges that would, that would get removed. All those existing ramps um, that are around there would get removed. You can, if you look closely, you can see those. They're kind of um, hatched out um, in like a gray sort of, hatching, shading there. Um, and then the, the two bridges on the interstate, those, those would get removed. Um, and then the bridge on 189 that, that currently goes over um, the ramps, that would get removed as well. Um, and it would consolidate everything into one large bridge over the interstate with one traffic signal in the middle. Um, and similarly to the previous um, interchange, um, design, it would consist of a new way for bicyclists and pedestrians to cross, cross the interstate a little bit more direct in this uh, situation compared to the previous. Um, to exit 14. First up, we have our diverging diamond interchange or DDI for short. And this would be a, a, a large kind of consolidation of the interchange itself. You can see the existing cloverleaf ramps kind of on the exterior um, of this interchange. Those um, are hatched out again. And so those would, those would no longer be there. Um, this is a, the same design that is currently being moved forward at exit 16. So if you've uh, been following that, that's what we're talking about here. And there's uh, videos available to, to see how that, that works. But if you're traveling east to west on route two, you would actually uh, cross over at the signals to the other side of the road um, as you proceed over the interstate and then cross back at the next signal. And the advantage of this is, is mainly just uh, efficiency reasons. It removes a lot of turns, uh, left turns in particular, um, which is also a safety improvement. And for the bicyclists and pedestrians, this would um, have uh, signalized crossings at each intersection and have a, a central shared use path that would be um, kind of 14 feet versus the 10 feet 10 foot shared use paths on both sides. So a little bit wider in the middle there where the paths on either side kind of come together. Okay. 
And here's our other option, the enhanced clover leaf, which more or less keeps the same configuration that's out there today, but makes improvements in its geometry, um, mainly in the name of safety reasons. And so it would, um, beginning um, on the left there, it would you know, reduce the radii at all the ramps, which would force drivers to slow down and make those crossings for bicyclists and pedestrians uh, much safer than they are today. It would um, have 10 foot shared use paths on both sides. Um, on the main line of the interstate itself, it, it adds an additional um, lane in each direction. Excuse me, it's not like on the main line in actual, um, it's a, where the ramps come in so that if you were, let's say you're traveling northbound on the interstate and you wanted to get off at exit 14, you would branch off of the main line of the interstate in, your, in a new, what we're calling a collector distributor lane. And then at that point, you could either choose if you wanted to go west or east. And the idea here is that it separates the weaving movements from the mainline traffic and therefore simplifies the decision-making process for drivers and increases uh, their safety. The only other thing I don't think I mentioned that I wanted to was that this would have an additional northbound on-ramp lane which is not present today. So Eleni mentioned there's uh, six goals as, as part of this that, that um, we came up with um, in, through working with the technical and advisory committees. And under each of these goals, we have um, a host of metrics. And those metrics are what we've um, used to evaluate each of these interchanges. Here are the other three. Um, I'm not going to, I won't read them. Yeah. yeah. So skipping right to the evaluation, um, we'll, we'll, we've, we've broken this apart to be a decision between um, either 12B or something at 13, and then what to, do and what to do at exit 14. So first up, we have 12B and 13 here. And you can see the, looking at the top box on the leftmost column, we have all the goals. So there's your six goals. And as you work your way across, you can see how each of the interchanges scored for each goal. Um, and then we have yeah, them totaled up um, in the black bar at the bottom. So the uh, PDI scored the highest um, as part of, between um, exit 13 and 12B. And we do have, uh, for those interested, available on the website is a complete breakdown of, of the, total, the, the larger evaluation matrix that you can you want to dive in to see how um, an interchange scored for a particular metric, um, you can do that. Um, and that's available on the uh, Envision 89 website. Could you just go back real quick, Lynn? Yeah, sure. All right. I, I just wanted to highlight, uh, you probably read this already, but the green shading in the top box just highlights, you know, which um, interchange scored the highest for each goal. And then Below there, we have the strengths and weaknesses for, um, we tried to kind of boil this down for everybody. Um, this is kind of our, what, what our takeaway is from the um, larger evaluation matrix that I mentioned. So you can see, you know, 12B had some large traffic reductions in certain areas, um, whereas exit 13, the SPDI had um, larger traffic reductions in other areas um, and also provides you know, a new bicycle pedestrian connectivity um, across 89. Can you move forward? So exit 14, a little bit closer in scoring um, with the DDI coming out three points ahead of the enhanced clover leaf. Strengths of the clover leaf were um, a higher anticipated decrease in crashes um, for, for um, vehicles, and that's largely due to the collector distributor lanes. 
uh, minimizing conflicts. And it also had the lowest uh, overall uh, costs at um, 119 19 million. And this combines the construction and preservation costs. Eleni, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think just to maintain this section of interstate between uh, 12B to 14 was on the order of 90 something million. I think it was 96. 96, yeah. yeah. Just it was a lot. People have that information out there. Yeah. Um, thank you, Jason. I'm just gonna, uh, are you done with your, sorry. Uh, I should just yeah. move it forward, no sorry. Uh, so uh, just, just to uh, finish up a little bit here, um, I'm sorry, we're taking a little bit more time that was budgeted, but uh, so uh, we had a lot of uh, outreach these past few uh, months with a lot of stakeholders, uh, communities, organizations, uh, and a lot of communication with South Burlington City Council, the committees in South Burlington, and uh, we also had uh, four focus groups with underserved populations to get their input on the 89. So what sli this slide shows is basically the, uh, the official recommendations we got up to date, up to now. The South Burlington City Council voted on April 19th to move forward with exit 12B uh, as a, as a, for further evaluation as part of the corridor bundles. And uh, you can see the South Burlington committees there that they mostly voted for exit 13 SBDI, uh, uh, you know, with the exemption, exemption of the Economic Development Committee, which voted for the, the 12B. Uh, our technical committee also met uh, in April and um, basically uh, suggested that based on the scores, uh, you know, that exit 13 SBDI uh, should move forward to further evaluation. Um, so taking all of this input, and we got a lot more input from a lot of more groups, and some of them were 12B, some of them were, you know, 13 SBDI. So this is what we are proposing. This is a proposal. This is, a, you know, the first time we are, you know, we're sharing with people, and we're going to be presenting this to our, um, uh, we shared this with South Burlington, and we're going to be presenting it to our advisory committee coming up. Uh, so this is the way we we think it's an appropriate way to move forward. So we have three bundles, three groups of improvements and investments that we're going to evaluate in task five, in, in the next task. So the first bundle we are proposing to what we call a more like a, a, a TDM, bike pad, uh, non-auto uh, non kind of a bundle. And we are including the 14 DDI in there because we believe that the 14 DDI, um, I think, uh, I don't remember if Jason mentioned, but it does decrease the actual capacity of that interchange. Uh, so, but it increases tremendously the safety and the connectivity of bike and pets. So our recommendation is that we're gonna evaluate this first bundle and then to move, to actually uh, include 13 SPDI in the second bundle and the 12B in the third bundle as we move forward to the evaluation. So the idea here is like, you know, um, we have a lot of contradictory kind of like uh, um, just uh, uh, recommendations here coming from very different groups. We haven't looked, and we looked at these interchanges uh, separately at this point and in isolation almost. So what we wanna do is like look at them together with a number of other improvements. So uh, we're gonna, this is our proposal uh, that we are bringing forward to the advisory committee. And finally, the next steps is that we're having a public meeting on Thursday. Uh, please uh, join in uh, go to the Envision 89 website and you're gonna find a lot of information there. We are gonna have our advisory committee meeting on the 19th where hopefully the decision on the interchanges and the bundles uh, take place. Uh, we're going to take the summer and fall to evaluate our corridor, um, the, the bundles, and then we can come back. We will come back to the public and the stakeholders to share the results. And hopefully uh, we will conclude this project uh, early uh, 2022. And uh, that is uh, our presentation. I know that we went over time, uh, over our allocated time, but uh, I don't know if we have time for questions. I'm going to stop sharing now. Great, thank you. So process-wise, because we do have 
mm-hmm. uh, a couple other major items for tonight. So I am mindful of time. Um, is this, is this meant to be a, an official um, feedback opportunity for you all? Like, are we expected to weigh in here? And if, if we do weigh in on this, cause I have a lot of thoughts on it. Is this, can you all hear me? Okay. Yes. Okay. Um, is now the time, is it important for us to weigh in right now? Does that help inform the process or? Um, so, so that's a great question. I think that uh, we are presenting it tonight. We are having a public meeting on Thursday. We are accepting, that. Yeah, so we are accepting comments after the public meeting too. I mean, we're meeting with the, uh, with the advisory, with the advisory committee, uh, May 19th. So we probably will be accepting uh, comments, I would say, um, until May 10th. Uh, we can put it on our website and make sure that people understand when the deadline is. Uh, I know that we... Oh, oh, when is it? May 7th. May 7th. Okay, we already... Uh, thank you, Charlie. I, I knew that we had a date, but I couldn't remember it. So May 7th is our date. So if you can just uh, either go to the website and just comment on the website. We got a lot of comments on our website. Uh, so you either do that, you send an, uh, you know, like comments to me, you give it to Nicole and it's going to bring it to us. Uh, you know, there are so many different ways uh, that you can, we, we want to hear from you. We want to, we want to get your comments. Yeah. So, yeah, but you have time. You, it doesn't need to be tonight. Great. Okay. I'll be sure to, I'll be sure to do that and weigh in and I'll be there on Thursday. Um, I just didn't know if the city council or, into this committee has any sort of formal role and if so do you need us is tonight is tonight a step in that process or is this just you sharing information with us yeah council I, I would say um you can have as much of a role as you want let us know if you'd like more public meetings on this in the city of burlington um you know recently we've been very focused on south burlington because that's where some of the improvements actually are and will have impacts on their neighborhoods but there are certainly implications for the city of Burlington here too. Um, so, and there's going to be, um, I think, a healthy discussion come the fall, you know, fall winter season. Also, as we start to get a more holistic picture of this. So, um, anytime, let us know. We're happy to come have more conversation and get more input. And yeah, Councillor Hanson, also just to add to that, I did not um, request to action on this tonight. This was an informational item, but as both Eleni and Charlie said, um, if the TUC would like to make a specific, take a specific action on anything you saw tonight, we still have time for those conversations and this was a lot to digest tonight as well. Um, and that can either happen through a TUC action directly or I'm happy to take those comments directly to um, the RPC through either the technical or the advisory committee meetings. Yeah. Okay. All right. Yeah. I mean, I, I, this, this is a really enormous project. It's enormous amount of money. It's a huge impact. So I definitely, I'm going to weigh in individually, but if the city of Burlington or the council has an opportunity to weigh in, I certainly think we should, because I think this is a big deal. Um, yeah. So I, I guess what I'm hearing is that we can we can do that, but it's kind of up to us. There's not that's not baked in to the process, but but we can. But you do welcome it. Oh yeah, yeah, and and um, yeah. I think just I think we're trying to take our cues from the municipalities and not trying to force process you don't want. Um, and and definitely this fall, I think when we have a more holistic picture um, of the recommendations, because right now we're still in a very hypothetical stage of, you know, what we're, we're looking at. So, um, yeah, we're, uh, I, you know, if you want to kind of target it either in the next month or two would be great or in the fall, winter, uh, either season works great for us. Okay, great. That's great to hear. I think uh, I'll definitely be advocating that we, that the council weighs in on this, um, but we and we can continue that discussion with staff and with other counselors. Okay. Um, and I'll be there on Thursday as well, but we really appreciate the presentation. And, um, Mark, did you have any questions? Um, I, I want to make sure while we're all here, um, Mark, if you have any questions for them while, while they're here or comments that you wanted to offer. 
Well, I did, I did have one question and I don't want to um, get too bogged down because I know there's um, other opportunities to give input, but um, early in the presentation, you mentioned that um, between exit 14 and 15, we were over capacity and which one of these enhancements would address that specifically? Would it be the 14 DDI concept? Would that address the, the capacity issues between 14 and 15, which would seem to be more directly um, applicable to Burlington specifically. Right. So I'm just going to start and maybe Jason can just jump in because he knows more about the modeling. But um, so the, the capacity issues that we identify was in 2050, right? So this is the future, not right now. So make that sure. Then that is also with the assumptions that we had in the model, which is pre-COVID, right? The, the traffic, uh, you know, uh, pre-pandemic. And, at the, the, and what we did for that is like we added a third lane on the interstate. The interchange improvement did not really affect it to it. Uh, you know, it affected, but not to a tremendous degree. And Jason, I'm going to stop talking and just tell me if I'm right. <laughs> yes. Okay, great. Yeah, it was the, th it was the third lane that it, was, it, it made it. The problem was, and I'm just going to stop talking after this, the problem was that if you add the third lane between 14 and 15, then you push the congestion between 15 and 16, right? So you have the bottleneck there. So that, that's another reason why we wanted to do this study versus just say we need a third lane on the interstate. Yeah, and it's really the next stage because we're looking at a, a whole uh, host of other kinds of investments to reduce traffic demand to see, do we really need to address the capacity there uh, with a big capital investment or can we do it you know, with transit, biking, walking, all those other things to reduce demand? So that's really the big question we're going to get to this fall. Great. Any other questions or thoughts, Mark? Just, just one, and you know, there's this talk of this giant federal infrastructure bill, and would that have any impact or influence on the schedule of these improvements, or, or would that be one of the triggers you alluded to that might move you in one direction or another in this plan? Yeah, I actually had a little bit of conversation with VTran staff earlier today about that topic and, and this study in particular. Um, I would say if we identify um, in that mix of improvements to reduce traffic, you know, the sidewalks, bike paths, transit routes, those things might be able to take advantage of this federal funding that's coming quickly. Um, or if there's some safety improvements and things like that, the bigger things, the, you know, the idea of an interchange, very unlikely that it's gonna be able to take advantage of this uh, kind of, uh, federal investment. Hey, thank I'm sorry you. if that disappoints anybody, but um, just trying to be realistic about the federal process, the permitting process, and frankly, the community um, uh, vision <laughs> process. Like, is that really what we want? I think we need to have a lot more discussion to know if we're ready for that. Hey, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Great. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Um, I do see, I believe... Gene's hand is up. I don't know if that's a carryover or Gene, were you, did you have questions or thoughts that you were looking to share? Or any members of the public before we move on to our next item? Okay. Um, yeah, I, um, I have some pretty big concerns with, with this proposal or plan or study, um, but I can, I can share those outside of this, this venue um, because uh, yeah, I know that there's a big public meeting coming up this week and other opportunities. And it sounds like the council has the opportunity to do that as well. Yeah, um, I would also add if there's any group, you know, that is also interested in having a conversation, we're completely open to that. So just please get in contact, so. Okay. Great, appreciate that. Um, all right, does anyone else have any questions or comments before we move on? Okay, seeing none. Well, thank you both so much for, for um, presenting and um, for the opportunity to continue engaging after tonight. All right, thank you. thank you very much. Great, take care. Bye. All right, bye. All right, that will move us to 
item five, water resource rate study. Um, we've got Megan Moore and Jenna Olson from DPW. Um, thanks for your patience and please take it away. Hi folks, and it is just me. I'm giving my staff the night off. Uh, Jenna's close to having her baby, so uh, she needs all the nights home she can. Um, and I also have Dave Fox, who is our consultant who worked on this project. I guess before we get started, um, uh, Councilor Hansen, we have presented to you uh, as recently as January. We've also had some more detailed conversations. Councilor Barlow, super excited to get you up to speed on this project, I guess Chapin and I wanted to check in and see what level of detail we sent a healthy memo, completely understand with your busy schedule if you weren't able to review all of the details. So I can I can give you the full spiel or we could go right to questions or I could try to do just a quick summary. What What is your pleasure? Um, may, may I? Um, yeah, yeah, go I, ahead. Yeah, that was that question that was, was for you because okay. I I, I've been deeply sort of briefed on this. So okay. there's it's really up to you though. No, if yep, you no, do want no a full explanation, that's totally fine. Well, I, I may have the full. I, I, well, you, you can tell me, Megan. Um, I did attend the um, one of the uh, community meetings you had and watched the presentation that was given. Okay. Um, and so is yep. that the same presentation you were going to do? Here? Um, largely. Uh, so did you, did you attend, uh, in January, February, like NPA yeah, or the recent I, I, pub the the public recent meeting? On, on, uh, the open house one, was it called? April 14th. Yes, that's the one. Okay. Then that helps because then I will focus, um, almost exclusively on the few minor tweaks and changes that we think are improvements, even since that public meeting, because okay. our staff are constantly thinking about how to make this better. So that, that is helpful. And then we can spend some more time on um, detailed questions. So let's do that. Does that work, Chapin? Okay. That works on my end. Is that okay, Councillor Barlow? Absolutely. Yeah. All right, good. And I, Thanks, and I can always I can always go back and go through any slide in a more detailed fashion. So great. let Thank me, um, let's see. So, I guess one one point I wanted to drive home because we we did spend a fair amount of time uh, have had a, a number of questions uh, about this particular thing um, because right now we are not drastically changing um, the differential and how much we charge commercial properties versus residential. The whole point of um, the affordability programs and the rate structural changes is to protect that essential amount of water that residents need to cook, clean, bathe, um, and so on and so forth. Whereas other types of water, which do have a higher burden on our system and aren't really related to the sort of essential life activities, um, we aren't currently charging uh, commercial customers a different volumetric rate, and here's why. Um, it's primarily, we, we're setting up a structure that will enable us to ask that question and work with the council in the future to continue the cost of service realignment. But when we started looking at the rate increases or the bill increases that our commercial customers in particular were going to be experiencing as the result of the introduction of the fixed, um, fixed charge uh, by meter size, as well as the private fire protection. Those, those two things themselves are sort of cost of service realignments. And with those changes alone, we were seeing uh, increases on average of about 9%, which is uh, a bit higher than what they would see under a status quo. Um, so for that reason, kind of to phase them in, as well as because of the impacts of COVID on the economy, um, we, you know, aren't choosing at this point to leverage that volumetric um, rate differential, but we just wanted to convey that that is something that could be in the future um, as we continue sort of the transition towards really making sure that each customer is paying a, a, in accordance with the burden that they put on the system. Um, the other piece that changed uh, was we took a, a closer look at our lifeline rate tier. Um, if you recall the presentations you've seen in the past, the lifeline rate tier was only going to apply to single family uh, residential properties. Um, and it, the tiers were going to be, uh, the break of the tier was gonna be at that median amount of usage, 400 cubic feet. 
Um, sure. I think it was shortly after, I don't know if it was the day after the uh, public meeting, we started looking at things a little bit more and running some other scenarios to see if we could in the, um, it, with the philosophy of trying to really help residential users with that essential amount of water to see if we could do that for our duplex and our triplex customers. And when we ran um, a scenario, we did, we were able to come up with one where uh, using the break points of the median usage for those particular types of properties. So for duplexes, it's 600 square, uh, 600 cubic feet. And for triplexes, it's um, 900 cubic feet. We were able to implement a uh, tiered program for those guys as well, which when we get to the um, customer impact, you'll see does yield some benefits for that type of customer. The other piece that changed was uh, doing the last fine tuning of the FY22 budget and using the rate structures that we are implementing or, or proposing, um, including fire service, addition of fire service and collecting that additional revenue from that. Our FY22 budget um, has room in it to allow rebates um, for the filming of private sewer laterals. So it's, we've discussed for a long time, it's been certainly a goal of mine before I retire, that we figure out how to help private properties deal with their sewer laterals. The sewer lateral is the piece of pipe between the sewer main, which is public, and the house. And unlike the water line, which does have some shared ownerships for portions of the line, the sewer lateral is entirely on the property owner. And time and time again, we see people have issues with that sewer lateral and then have to pay emergency costs, You know, sometimes in the realm of eight to 10,000 bucks to replace that lateral. We're hoping that with this program, we can at least get people engaged in knowing what the condition of their lateral is so that they can start planning um, for those, those larger costs. It will also give us some data about the condition, the general condition of the laterals that we could hopefully um, turn into potential future loan or grant programs for pseudo-lateral replacement. We're also keeping an eye on some of the um, federal stimulus funding money that's coming to the state and think there may be a possibility of being able to leverage that for um, lateral and service line replacement, but those details haven't been worked out. The other piece that we added is um, some conservation assistance rebates, um, uh, providing up to $75, $75 per household for a water sense plumbing fixture. A dual flush low flow toilet is about a hundred bucks. And so, you know, that would be a great thing to put this money towards and be able to start help reduce your amount of water that you're using, which can hopefully bring your bill down and get you down into that first tier. So I think uh, that those were sort of the functional um, elements that we added to our current proposal that we're trying to bring forward to the council. I also added, a, I don't think, I don't believe that this was in the public meeting, um, but it's something that certainly has come up in discussion and we wanted to kind of just address the elephant in the room that the um, water resources assistance program, the sort of foundation of our, um, not the foundation, but the, the piece of our affordability program that we think is really gonna help um, some of our income constrained customers, which is the fixed fee waiver. Right now, as it's constructed, and frankly, as it's constructed in many communities across the country, it's really going to only apply to single family properties and other individually metered residential units where the occupant is the account holder. Um, we did add, uh, with one of the turns of the wheel, um, added the fixed fee waiver for nonprofit affordable or senior housing accounts. But the fact of the matter is, is generally renters and multifamily rentals are not gonna have access in this phase. We get that 64% of properties in Burlington are rentals and we're missing a potentially large proportion of people who actually need help. Um, you know, why is it that we can't figure this out? One of the reasons is that if we, if we um, provide the fixed fee waiver to landlords, we don't have any control over whether that landlord's going to pass on that affordability measure. Um, good landlords will, but there's lots of landlords who might not decide to pass it on. The other tricky piece that I mentioned is that those multifamily units often share a meter. You could have four, six, however many um, units in a building, and there's only one meter for that building. And so, you know, just giving them the fixed fee waiver is not really going to be beneficial. And we really need to think about how we could provide benefit to the individual units. As I mentioned, water, water utilities across the country you know, have struggled to address this gap. They're called hard to reach customers and don't have a renter specific program. Only this year, DC Water launched a program that we think could be applicable to a place like Burlington. Um, 
and I'd be happy to get into what those details are. But suffice to say, we want we kind of want them to forge forge ahead, and we want to watch how their program uh, rolls out. We want to have a year with at least a year up to eighteen months with our own program to see how many people actually apply. Uh, even given the current eligibility, and also then see how much money we may have may left over um, from the nugget that we've we've set aside for this type of program. But what we want to do is is commit to the council that by April 2023 we're gonna, you know, bring some options back to the council so that we can have that conversation about sort of what what RAP 2.0 or what the next level of affordability is that we can provide. And with that, I think other than uh, this slide, which shows those those new tiers for the duplex and the triplex, uh, that would be something that you hadn't necessarily seen before. And then showing the benefit to the duplex and the triplex customers, um, particularly at the median volume range, uh, you're seeing Megan, a pretty- We don't see the presentation, so if you need to share the screen. Oh. <laughs> That's why I tried to share it a long time ago. <laughs> Sorry, I wasn't sure if you that's had thought okay. uh, you were looking no, at something that's, or not. I, I, I was, was, I was, I'm I was sorry. wondering that. I thought about interrupting, but um, um, well, let me. We can see it now. Okay, it's, dang I was it. Following along before. Okay, um, okay. Well, this is probably the only one where I need to actually point out the what I'm talking about. So I guess it'll be what it is. Uh, without the rate restructuring, when we, we do the, the bill, if we were just to continue things as is, um, the typical single family residential customer would see an, a bill increase of about 5.9% uh, given our revenue needs, given the fact that we need to collect money to kind of help with the fact that we didn't have a rate increase last year and then also primarily to address debt service that's coming, start payments that are starting for all of our capital investments. Um, so. Keep that in mind as we look at what changes we may see in the bill under this proposal. This proposal, and I'll come back to the low volume um, customer, single family low volume customer, because um, I know that one sort of jumps off the page as like what's going on. Um, so for the median volume customer, so this is not somebody who is income burdened or has you know demonstrated that they're uh, uh, qualified for any of those other federal programs. Your average customer who uses 400 cubic feet a month is going to basically see no change or a very slight decrease in their bill over this this year's bill, assuming they use the same amount of one, of, of um, water. If in fact they qualify for RAP, so they show us evidence of uh, qualifying for SNAP or Three Squares, LIHEAP, one of those programs, um, they're going to see a significant decrease um, under under the, our our affordability program. We're also seeing, you know, uh, positive benefits for the median customer in the duplex and the triplex, and that really corrected what we were sort of seeing when we looked at the data um, with just the single-family tiers. And then for multifamily residentials that qualify for that RAP waiver, the low-income housing and the senior housing, it's going to be different for every type of property depending on what other features they may have, like fire services or the size of meters, but. Uh, for some examples that we pulled, we're generally seeing a, a good benefit for them. So what about these low volume customers? The challenge is with these low volume customers in this year, in this transition, because the, um, the fixed fee, they're seeing a fixed fee uh, for their meter size, a readiness to serve charge for the first time. Um, residential customers currently don't have one at all. Um, and uh, commercial customers have a minimum charge where there's a, a, a volume of water that's associated that they get charged um, every single month. But it's not really a readiness to serve charge like you would see on your, your gas or your electric bill. Because I think as we all know, even if nobody turns on the faucet, we still have to maintain our pipes, our pumps, our staffing, all of that. And so that, that is very important because our fixed fee, our fixed expenses um, for water are, are actually in the neighborhood of about 20%. Um, with the current fees that we are proposing, we would be recouping about 10%. And that is another thing that over time, we would be working with the city council to potentially um, bump that up so that we slowly bring our fixed fees potentially more in line with what our fixed expenses are. So we've had a lot of heartache over this low volume customer. I think if it wasn't for the fact that we do have this sort of um, uh, 
security blanket for somebody who truly is experiencing a um, financial burden and who qualifies for RAP, um, then I probably would have more heartache about this low volume customer. Uh, the fact that we have this program and that if somebody is doesn't use a lot of water but has income constraints, they are still going to see a benefit from that program. Um, the slow volume customer is gonna see an increase overall annually of about $4.25 a month or $51, $51 a year. Um, and we're, we're hoping that within the context of everything else that we're providing, folks understand sort of the mechanism of why this is happening. And it's really bringing those low volume customers uh, back towards sort of an equitable charge because even right now they're being charged entirely volumetrically and they're not actually contributing enough to those fixed fees. Uh, Dave, did I explain that well enough? I don't know if there's anything else or if anybody has any questions because I know this this is a sticky part. I think you did a great job explaining that, Megan. Um, this obviously looks bad from a, a presentation standpoint, you know, just looking at that number, but uh, there's a, a strong impetus for, for wanting to make that change. Um, and, and just one other thing I'd point out is that the rate structure that we're proposing to align with that, with the, the lifeline rate, um, over time, we'll be able to more mm -hmm. easily adjust the volumetric rates to not necessarily impact that low volume customer um, and can actually will be beneficial from them from a, um, a bill impact standpoint in future rate increase uh, years. So um, although it looks a little, little scary from a percentage standpoint right now with our first iteration, uh, the, the volumetric structure with that lifeline rate will allow us to not as negatively impact that, that low volume customer with future iterations. Thanks, Dave. Sure. Uh, this, is the, the, this is a snapshot of some um, typical commercial or institutional and again, this looking at these percent increases that they have is one of the reasons why we are not fully leveraging the the cost justified, you know, increase in volumetric rate for them at this time. Um, I think that is I think that's it. Other than just you know highlights, which I may have shared uh, at the public meeting. We, we are super excited to, if you remember one of the slides that had the triangle that talked about, you know, raising sufficient money to be able to take care of the system, but not having it impact the people who are already having a hard time paying for it. Um, and I think that we've accomplished that. The FY22 budget, we were able to build it with proper operation and sustainable stewardship of infrastructure, as well as that targeted funding, funding for customer assistance programs. Um, if we weren't doing this rate restructuring, everybody was gonna be seeing a, you know, a healthy increase on their bill. But with the proposed changes in particular, those income qualified ratepayers and seniors are gonna see a decrease in their overall water resources bill, um, potentially saving them a hundred bucks a year for somebody who uses you know, that, that 400 cubic feet a month. Um, the vast majority of single family ratepayers are going to see a benefit on their water resources bill, i.e. a less than 5.9% increase. Um, you know, and then various other users are going to see potentially decreases like the duplex and the triplex customers who use that median usage. Um, and then this really sets us up for our future of how we can price water in it as we move forward and making sure always that we keep affordability in mind um, around that essential residential water usage. Um, while also making sure that we are still collecting enough money to properly steward our system. So I think with that, uh, we, we do come here tonight with, uh, to ask for the TUC support, uh, if you're willing to give it, um, and recommendation to the city that the city council adopt this rate structure and affordability program. We are planning currently to go to the city council or board of finance and city council on May 10th. Uh, Hopefully with that approval, we would then actually be coming back with the specific rates, uh, the ones that we've shown you um, for the city council's approval when we approve the budgets um, uh, for FY22. Uh, with that approval in place, we will then shift our outreach to a pretty healthy amount of education of our customers. This is going to be a pretty big sea change as far as what our bills look like. How those rates are, how the bills are calculated, and we—it's always going to help our customer service folks if we do a lot of uh, pre-education even before that first bill comes out in August. 
Um, so I think that is our plan and I will stop sharing now that I shared. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, Councillor Barlow, any questions or thoughts? Uh, yeah, I did have a couple of questions. Um, first on the, um, the low tier customers, like as a percentage of the, uh, of the user base, what, what do they represent? Because I mean, they're, they're they seem to be impacted more, but are they are there a lot of them? Or do you get my question? Yeah, I think Dave, I have it written down somewhere. I want to say it's like in the 15, 16 percent range. 16 percent. Um, 16 percent of the uh, residential customers fall within two CCF or below per month. The single family residentials, yeah. Single family residential, thank you. 200 or? 200, yep. Okay. I also had sort of a, just a technical question about on the on the lifeline uh, rate tier, it was 400 for a single family home, but it was like um, mm, yep. 300 for every sort of increment above that. I was wondering where the, yep. under, the extra 100 was on the I did, family. Did, didn't get into that nuance. And those numbers actually come mm -hmm. from our data, like looking at the median. Um, yeah. And it when you think about it, it kind of does make sense because generally a duplex, duplexes are gonna have shared yard space. Generally those units are smaller and probably don't have as many bathrooms and people. It's not you know monolithic. There's some duplexes that are probably ginormous. But generally speaking, duplexes and triplexes are going to have be smaller units. And so it is not uncommon to see that their per unit um, usage is less than a single family home. And I also had a question was the were these uh, tweaks that um, you've made since the public meeting or is that information updated on the uh, affordability project webpage if I wanted to point people to it. I will make sure about that. I don't know off the top of my head because, uh, but I, I will make sure it gets posted posted tonight because we may not have updated this. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, in general, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt the single family folks. It only helps the duplex and the triplex, um, but we should get that information out so that people can see it and be even happier. Um, and, and generally, just as, as feedback, I think it's, 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 um, it does a good job of addressing affordability and uh, sustainability of the system overall. So nice Thank job. You. Thank you very much. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Um, I have a few questions as well. So I think you had told me this when we met, but the duplex and triplex, um, the rates, that's still, we're still only talking about owner-occupied situations, or are we now talking about renters within that? Those um, those rates will be applied to those properties. Um, it, again, is going to be up to the landlord whether or not, so say if somebody's right. paying a certain amount of rent and that water is in part of that rent, it will be up to the landlord whether if they see a benefit on the water bill that they pass it on right. to, to the renter. Um, the only place where it would, where somebody would see that if it was, um, Occasionally, we see duplexes that do have separate meters. Although, actually, those duplexes that have separate meters would be treated as single-family residentials, but they will see the benefit uh, directly. Um, and certainly, an owner-occupied duplex is going to, you know, reap the benefits for their own unit, and then right. they get they get to decide what they do with 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 their duplex uh, friend. Right. Right. Um, yep. Okay. Um, and then my other question or just point, I guess, to reiterate is, so yeah, there is this huge disparity among the low volume customers between the lifeline rate, which is like a pretty significant decrease, I think 13, 13 more than 13%. And then without the lifeline rate, it's a significant increase of 14%. And so I think that really underscores and the whole thing but especially that underscores the importance of the folks who are in need understanding how to sign you know getting them enrolled yeah. because otherwise they're going to get hit hard so what it really is going to come down to is 
our ability as a city to get those folks enrolled. And can you yep. talk a little bit about how we're going to try to make sure that everyone who needs it is getting on to that lower rate? Yeah, we've been um, having some meetings about that particular outreach, but again, we we see that outreach, that particular piece of outreach around the the affordability program and the fixed fee waiver as being probably the most important piece of outreach that we do. Uh, we we didn't we didn't end up translating the informational part postcard that went out earlier, but we are working on translations of all of this information. Um, that we would be working with various partners, whether it's the family room or ALLV. Our current concept is to figure, do another postcard and figure out how to direct people to those locations where we then could have complete information packets in all of the different languages um, for accessibility. We're certainly open to other ideas, but we know like we need to be doing, you know, it, it would be successful to me to see all of the money that we set aside for this program actually get used. That often doesn't happen in these types of programs. Um, we were very conservative with how much, how many customers we assumed would apply for this. Um, the other piece that we're keeping an eye on and we'll certainly be communicating with ratepayers on is the new Lie WAP. So there's a program that's going to be like Lie Heap coming. Um, they're working on it right now. I'm still figuring out exactly how that's going to be administered. I think Vermont is figuring out how it's going to be administered because it's not just about income sensitivity, but also the percentage of your income that is being used by your water bill. And I don't, I haven't figured out how the state's going to figure that out without engaging us. Um, I think we're probably in Burlington going to be maybe better set up than other communities to actually help administer that, that funding. I'm really hoping that's the case. And that may also help with the renters that may be a bypass in the short term of how we can help rental folks. Um, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I think that's a great point. It's just the need to continue um, trying to get at the majority of residents who are renters um, within this. Um, but so just from a high level in terms of outreach, so there's postcards that are going out to customers. There's, you said you're working with different community groups. Can you just run through the other outreach NPAs, front porch forum? I mean, yes, the sta the standard suite NPAs, front mm -hmm. porch forum. Um, I think we've recently learned about, you know, possibility of radio. I think we're open to new new uh, types of outreach that are um, uh, not usually within our wheelhouse. I mean, having our partners with CVOEO so that they know about our program so that if somebody <laughs> shows up and is applying for other types of assistance, mm -hmm. immediately letting them know and having information there that if you're already qualifying for these other programs, like you just need, all you have to do is mail in proof of that program to us. Mm -hmm. we, try, we try to keep it as low burden as possible yeah. We are qualifying people for a whole year. You know, if somebody mid-year that we've qualified them for the fixed three rate happens to all of a sudden, you know, hit the jackpot and it doesn't have an income constraint, we're not going to be knocking on their door. We're going to, you know, just say that that is the universe doing good things. Um, but people will have to, they will have to reapply on an annual basis, but they, their qualification for our program would be good for 12 months. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Again, we're not, they're not submitting income. We're not reviewing income. We're just saying, hey, clearly one of these other programs has already reviewed your income. Right. We're going to take that proof. Right. Um, right. For, for, for seniors, they would just need to show proof of their age. Uh, there yeah. was one concern uh, at a public meeting that there were going to be seniors who didn't really need this help, who were going to be getting it. Right. We're, re we're relying on people generally not applying for assistance unless they have a financial need. Um, so, And is that communicated to the seniors as well? Like, are they discouraged from applying? Like, it, does it lay out, please only apply for this based on need or? Yeah, I mean, we haven't, we have not developed the official, we're working on those outreach materials, but I think we would make it clear that if you're having trouble paying your bill, you know, if you, mm -hmm. uh, if you're on a fixed income and you're having trouble paying your bill, you know, you can, you are eligible for this. Okay. Are people, you know, are people going to potentially take advantage of it? Maybe, but. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, there's always that risk, but I think a lot can be done just communicating the program because if it's communicated as, Oh, you're a senior, you're, yes. it's good. Then they'll be yep. like, great. Why not? You know, but right. if it's communicated as need-based, I think a lot of people will say, Oh, I don't, I don't need it. You know? Yeah. Um, I mean, at the same time, we want to be careful because I think sometimes the senior population is, is proud and doesn't want to ask for help. So it's a fine line because we, we just don't, we don't want somebody who right now they figure it out because they, you know, they don't buy the right food or they skimp on their medicine. We just don't want ever any, want anybody to be in that situation. Yeah. And so it's a fine line of having it be welcoming. But as you said, not having the door wide open for anybody to walk through because it's not a free ice cream cone. Right. Right. Um, that's great. Yeah. I think, and, and then the other question on, on getting folks in who need it, um, is there an ongoing tracking of that metric and sort of to, to monitor, you know, up, uptake of that and where it should be versus where it's at, where it is. And <clears throat> yeah, I mean, we would be able to, with our billing system, say who, how many customers how many customers um, qualified for the fixed fee because it'll actually be like a different uh, thing in the in in the billing system so we'd be able to run reports and then compare that against uh, what Dave and Raftelis's estimates were of how many customers mm -hmm. that's great yeah I just want to make sure that we're not sort of just putting it out there and saying okay great whoever takes it great and if not not like I want us to be Yep. I don't want it to be acceptable if it does have low uptake. You know what I mean? Absolutely. No, it shouldn't be just lip service. It should be actually to help people for sure. And, and, and if people aren't, if people aren't, you know, applying, figuring out why that is, if it's a communication barrier, if it's, we made something too hard about the program, if it's that we aren't considering enough of the different qualification programs um, we're definitely open to all, all of that. Great. Great. Well, that's, yeah, those are all my questions. I really, really appreciate, um, all of the work that you all have done on this. It's going to have a huge impact for, for people in our community and especially folks struggling. And this was the very, the very first issue that I grappled with when I got on the council. And it's really cool to see just, um, how intensely that you all have dug in and, and made this happen. And it really is going to pay off now. So I really, really appreciate that. Thank you so much, Councilor Hanson. That means a lot. Yeah. And this is going to set us up as you, what you really hammered home when we met and tonight a little bit is this new regime puts us in a position to where we can go even deeper with equity, you know, with creating an equitable system um, for decades to come. So it's really exciting and I'm looking forward to supporting it. Yeah. It's kind of crazy that we just charge everybody the exact same amount, like sort of when I took this job, that's just the way it was. And I hadn't ever really thought about it. And we started digging mm -hmm. into it. I'm like, Whoa. Yeah. And then all, and then all the stuff that we don't charge for that we basically provide like all the fire flow capacity. Um, so it has mm -hmm. been very eye opening. Absolutely. Great. Well, um, Councillor Barlow, would you like to make a motion on this item? Um, I would be glad to. I'm just not exactly sure of the motion that I'm making, I guess. Is it should it be in the memo? bottom of the memo. Oh, the bottom of the memo yeah. is a sample resolution or a sample motion, if you would like. Okay. It's uh -huh. page seven. Page seven of the memo. The water rates standing in the memo. It's, yeah, the bottom of page seven, there's motions and page seven. it's a one sentence um, motion. If you can't find it, I'm happy to make well, it as well. I'm uh, on page seven of the water rate study memo or on our agenda? Yeah, of the water rate study memo, page seven of that. Page seven, it doesn't have a motion mm. on that. Um, interesting. All right. Well, I'm if happy you, to, if you make the motion, I'll gladly glad second. Okay, great. Yeah, I can do that. We must be looking at different documents, but yeah, I will, I'm in the appendix, I think, but, oh, okay. 
Got it. Page seven. Would you like me to make the motion? Now that sure, yeah, if you have it, go ahead. Okay. I move to recommend that the city council approve and adopt the 2021 water resources rate restructuring and affordability program proposal. I second that. Any final questions, thoughts um, from you, Councillor Barlow, or anyone on staff have anything else to share? I don't. All right, great. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 All right, that passes unanimously, noting Councillor Stromberg's not here, but thank you both so much for, for presenting and for all your work on this these past two years, two plus years. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the time that you guys have invested. Absolutely. All right, great. Okay. That closes. Thank you. thank you. All right, take care. That closes that item. Um, and now we will move to... Our next item, consolidated collection, and we've got Uvi Perry from DPW um, presenting. How's everyone doing this evening? Pretty good. Good. Pretty good. How are you? Uh, it's been a day. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, doing well, thanks. Um, mm -hmm. So should I do a, a quick overview of the memo? I realize Councillor Barlow has not had as much information as uh, Councillor Hansen. We did have a previous discussion to kind of bring them up to speed um, at where we're at now. Um, we all got the memo last week. Uh, mm -hmm. Don't know if you had a chance to review it or not. I think an overview would be great. Is Councillor Barlow, did, were you gonna share something? Um, well, only that um, Maddie did provide me with a recording of the of the March meeting and I haven't been able to listen to all of it, but I've listened to about half of it. Um, and uh, Lee and Chapin also um, brought me up to speed a little bit on my, at my request this afternoon. So, um, and, and I have read the memo. So I am sort of apprised up to this point, unless there are additional details we haven't, we haven't covered, but I welcome any additional background as well, of course. Okay, so I think we kind of brought you up to speed to at least the uh, March two meeting. So we presented our uh, conceptual budget at the March two meeting uh, with a 0% opt out and 25% opt out um, chart similar to the one in the current memo. Um, and upon discussion, it was asked that we go back and make the chart reflect the original um, options that were outlined in the franchise model at 0% opt-out and 15% opt-out. So that's what we have done since the March meeting. I went back, I can share my screen if needed um, to bring that uh, chart up with the current options. If you would like, or we can just- Yeah, I think that's good for the public to be able to see it. Can you all see my screen? Um, it says that you're screen sharing, but it doesn't show the screen. Maybe you, okay, now now we can see it, yeah? So you see the memo? Yeah. yeah. Okay, perfect, thank you. So yeah, I'll go right down to the chart here. So mm -hmm. we, we reworked the, the opt-out options, 0% opt-out, 15% opt-out, 25% opt-out and reflected the changes in our municipal option. We did the same as well for the franchise model at zero and 15. Um, and when I was running the numbers, I found that there was a, an arithmetical error for the franchise option that actually lowered that cost from 4.12.83 to 4.10.03. And upon reviewing the 15% opt-out option, and comparing it to what I had for a 25% opt-out franchise option, there really wasn't a big difference, as you can see, in the monthly and annual costs. Um, upon reviewing my, my figures, I went off of what the consultant had 
on their uh, cost table. And because they only had up to 15% opt out, I didn't have that additional overhead information. So those numbers um, need to be updated for the 25%. I recently talked with the consultant. They're supposed to get back to me tomorrow with updated numbers for the 25% opt out. Um, so that's why we have those asterisk with an ex explanation below. Um, so you can see the cost differences between the 15% opt out and our 0% opt out. I think it's, you know, it, it's minimal and it's, you know, comparative to what the franchise model is. Um, you know, we're a little bit higher. Yeah. Great. And, you know, what we're looking for is, you know, we're not looking for a recommendation tonight. Um, we have some more outreach and research to do on the municipal model and, uh, you know, municipal hybrid model as well. Um, so we'd like to get that information and bring it back to you at your May meeting. And as it says in a memo, memo you know, request a, a recommendation then uh, to proceed to council. Got it. Got it. Okay. All right. Um, Councillor Barlow, any questions or comments? Um, well, only that I really appreciate uh, the um, your responsiveness this afternoon to sort of try to bring me up to speed. I realize I'm I'm new to this. Um, I had shared with them some of um, my initial um, thinking on it or thoughts on it. Um, and I welcome the opportunity to spend a little bit more time reviewing some of the material and um, listening to uh, some of the pr prior meetings that had happened on this. So only that. Great, great. Thanks, Councillor Barlow. Um, I, yeah, I also really appreciate all the work that's gone into this. And I also did receive a communication during this meeting um, from Damian Gilbert, the president of um, the, lo the local AFSCME union. Um, and he expressed support of um, the municipal option, which was something I was very, I, I was very curious to understand um, where the union was at. So that was just something I wanted to know. I, that matters a lot to me personally, um, per perhaps other, other folks as well. Um, so I want to, I see that we still have members of the public and I know a couple folks had speak, spoken to this item initially. Um, so I'll just, I'll open that up before I share my thoughts. Um, do, do any members of the public who are on want to speak at this time to this item? I see Cameron. Um, yeah, Cameron, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if anyone could provide any sort of timeline as to when more final decisions would be made. Because like I said, the, um, the free market isn't moving forward and in investing in these in new equipment and the, and the things that will, will drive the rates down naturally um, until these decisions are made. Mm -hmm. um, so that's, that's my concern. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Yeah, that's, that's great. Um, Lee or Chapin, could you walk us through expected timeline at moving forward on this? Yes. Uh, happy to. Uh, our goal is to do the additional research that uh, Lee talked about and be able to share that in advance of your next Tuke meeting and as well in advance of the DPW commission meeting in May so that both bodies could make a recommendation to the council. Ultimately, uh, at that point, uh, it's the council's deliberations. And, uh, you know, there is a question given uh, the pandemic and the difficulty with public engagement around an important policy issue like this as to what additional outreach uh, we want to try to do. There was uh, significant engagement around the GBB study, uh, which looked at a franchise model. Uh, these meetings have been open and, and we've tried to work with our public information manager to get the word out 
um, but that that's a question for the for the body here and for the council. Uh, our thought would be that after you deliberated in May, that if you had a recommendation at that point, that it could be brought to the council at one of the two June meetings. Great. And ultimately, it's the council's choice of where it wants to go at that point. And thank you. Okay. 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 Great. And and I think the other thing I'll just speak to. Cameron's point as well, that still is up in the air that we would need to, I think, determine if we, well, regardless of what direction we go with this policy is sort of that on-ramp or that timeline of implementation too. So I think we are getting close to making a policy decision. And I think that's good. We've been grappling with this for a long time. And I, I agree that we should get this over to the full council at this point and let the full council, um, you know, decide. So I'm supportive of moving this out of committee and making our recommendation um, next month. And then I think, yeah, part of that and part of what the council is going to need to decide is not only what direction we go, but how we get there and how long it takes for us to get there. Chapin, did you want to add to that? Sure. Um, you know, as the GBB study pointed out, that under either model, we're looking at uh, a significant time period from the point of decision by the, the, the council uh, to the point of actually switching over. Uh, the, yeah. reason, the reason for that is that there are significant uh, efforts that need to be put in place for the bidding of this, uh, the selection, if we go the franchise model, if we go the municipal op operations model, what, you need to give time for the current haulers to kind of phase out and be able to plan uh, as well as for us to build a new building, to acquire the assets, to hire staff. Uh, I think 18 months on the, on the near end would be a very aggressive and would expect it to be two years or potentially more, but we, we will cross that bridge and get a tighter timeline, uh, the closer uh, we get to making a policy decision on which way we're going. Okay. Just to clarify, you, you just mentioned 18 months to two years. Um, that would be the consolidation services beginning or the just final decision being made? Uh, I was describing the, the process to move towards implementation once the council made a decision on yep. the direction, the amount of time it would take to move to implementation. Gotcha, thank you. Yeah, I think the de just to piggyback off of that, the decision, I think we're getting close now. You know, we've been grappling with this for quite a long time and it sounds like the path we're on now is to get it to the full council. Um, the, the full council would have this for June um, and they wouldn't, it's not, not necessarily that the council would vote on at it initially at their first meeting getting it, though that is the norm when we send things out of this committee. Usually the council votes on it immediately. We could take a couple of meetings, but I wouldn't see it. I wouldn't expect it to take um, much longer than a month or so. You know, it could be that first meeting that the council votes on it, or maybe that's an informational session and maybe a meeting or two later we vote on it. Is is my expectation. You never know how these things are going to play out, but I do think we're, we're getting very close to a decision, but I think there would be an on-ramp um, leading up to that. And just to share my perspective and thoughts on it, I think, you know, I'm, I'm, I've become more, over time, I've become more supportive of the municipal option. That's definitely where I'm at at this point is supporting that. Um, and, but I, I, um, I don't feel, I would rather um, take the time to phase that in properly. I don't feel like we need to really rush the implementation. I don't feel too much urgency on how quickly we would need to implement it, but I do feel like that is the direction that we should go. So kind of just where I'm at and just to share with you yep, all thanks. is- yeah, my concern isn't how long implementation will will take. Uh, my concern is more about the decision making process. So that clarifies a lot for me. Thank you. Great, great. Um, 
Yeah. So I support municipal. I support taking as much time as we need to get there, even if that takes whatever, two, three, four years. I don't know. Um, any other thoughts from you, Councillor Barlow, um, on this? Um, no, not, not yet. Like, again, like I said earlier, I've, I've uh, started to digest all the work that's been done to date. Mm -hmm. um, and I know there's a lot of it. So um, yeah. I am, um, I'm grateful for the opportunity not to have to vote on this this evening. Great. Sounds good. Um, so sounds like you're not looking to make any motions on this item. And I'm fine with that. I'm, I don't need to make any motions either. Um, so before we close out this item, any final thoughts from anybody else, whether it's members of the public or staff or Councillor Barlow? Um, just one, and, and this wow. arises from my conversation uh, with Chapin and Lee this afternoon, is I would like to understand what the impact is to... Um, some of the local businesses who um, make their living like, like Cameron's, you know? Um, so whether it's the, the, tr the trash haulers or the, uh, the compost collectors, I just would like to know what the impact is to um, the private sector. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Potential if we went with a, mu a municipal option or even a franchise option that excluded some from participating. Mm -hmm. And staff, have you all had much engagement with, um, I mean, we have Cameron here right now tonight, um, who is a comp, who is a organics hauler. Um, have you had much engagement from other players in the industry? I haven't gotten much feedback from the bigger outfits. They weren't too um, talkative about the subject, I guess. You know, I, I kind of asked for some information and they were, you know, not inclined to give it. Um, when I did initially reach out to, um, you know, the area uh, compost collectors, I did talk to a couple um, when I was, you know, letting them know about their public engagement and, you know, got a sense from some of them that they weren't interested in bidding on that uh, franchise option if, if the opportunity came about. Um, but no, I, as far as what losses would be, I, I, I really couldn't tell you right now. I, I could do some outreach and see if they'll give me any information or, or their thoughts. Um, so, oh, but me, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. Can, you can finish. Sorry. I said they were, they were all emailed and, you know, I, I did my outreach to them for both public meetings um, to attend so they could, don't see what impacts the study had on it. And um, I didn't see too many people show up from any of the, uh, like the Gothiers or, or any of those Myers, mm -hmm. any one of, of those attend the meetings. Got it. Got it. Yeah. I mean, my, my thought on it is I think it's really important to make folks aware. I don't, I don't know to what extent I, I don't feel that you all need to sort of press them to, you know, press them to weigh in or provide information is my perspective. And maybe that's, maybe that's conflicting with what Councillor Barlow is saying, but I do want to make sure that they are aware of the process and know what's going on and have the opportunity to weigh in, which it sounds like is the case at this point. Yes. Um, so that's my perspective. I don't know, Councillor Barlow, if you had more any more to share on it or say on, about it. Well, I would I would just um, I guess uh, clarify that I don't think they need to be pressed, but um, to be made aware that a decision of this magnitude would be very impactful potentially to their businesses, and if they're unwilling to share information with you, you know, perhaps a, a non-disclosure agreement or something like that, or explaining to them the reasons for which you might not. Uh, you would be seeking the information or analysis. I mean, I don't know. I just, I could see that there are local businesses who could be impacted by this. And I think we have to be mindful of that when we make decisions like this. Can I chime in? 
Great. Um, Cameron, yeah, go ahead. Thanks. Um, I actually have not been contacted regarding this, uh, which is somewhat concerning because I am 99% certain that I'm the largest hauler of household compost in Burlington um, and in South Burlington. Um, we've, we service thousands and thousands of residents here. Um, so I, I'm kind of shocked that outreach was done, but we didn't even catch wind of it. Um, but anyways, on that note, I'm, I've been in contact with a lot of these haulers regarding this consolidation. And I, I can certainly speak, um, not on behalf of them, but to the, um, the mindset of haulers in general. So if anybody does want to discuss, um, what we're experiencing or just wants information from our end, please let me know. I'm happy to provide as much information as possible. Great. I, I did do outreach and I did send you an email on 721 for the outreach for our public meeting to Cameron.Scott at nowastecompost.com. Is that the correct email address? Yeah, that is correct. Thanks, Lee. Yep. Sorry, I didn't catch that. I appreciate no it. You're welcome. Okay. And that, that was just to clarify for folks watching and listening that time period was the time period in which we were really pushing to get input from the public. That's around the time when we had um, this, the public sessions on this. So that kind of corresponds with when we were doing the last big outreach push around this item. Um, Chapin. Yes, thank you. Uh, public information manager, Rob Goulding, Lee and I are gonna be meeting here in the next day or two to get uh, uh, another plan in place for one big push to your point, uh, Councillor Hansen. This, as we near a decision, we need to be going back out to the public and making sure they're aware that this is coming down the pike. So uh, this has our full attention and uh, we will give it the time and care and feeding and would ask the councillors and other members of the public interested on this to, to help us get the word out. Great. Yeah, that, that's great. And as I said, I do feel, I feel we've been grappling with this for a long time and have done a lot of work and due diligence. So I, I do feel it's ready to continue. But that being said, you know, we, we should, of course, be publicizing it as we, as we move close to that decision. Um, sounds like we're all on similar pages. Any other comments, questions before we close this item? Okay, seeing none, we'll close down that item. Thanks everyone um, for weighing in on that. And thanks for the presentation, Lee. Thank you, thanks for having me. Absolutely. All right, great. So that brings us to our next item, which is I believe um, counselors, or is it director's report or counselor's report? I don't. Uh, director's report. Director's report, yeah. Go ahead, Director Spencer. All right, thank you, Councillor Hansen. Uh, so construction season's now underway. We are very excited to uh, be shifting gears from winter maintenance to uh, construction. We're touring the NPAs, uh, depending on schedules, either this month or the following month with overviews of uh, the work that's coming down the pike. We're really excited. One of the big projects this year is the Shelburne Street Roundabout, which will be under construction in the next month or two. It will be a two-year uh, process with significant traffic uh, control to keep uh, traffic flowing in and around the project. So more information is online. Uh, we're also working with parks and waterfront businesses to talk about the bike path relocation on the waterfront to bring passenger rail to Burlington, which is a really exciting project. Great collaboration. Uh, and uh, we're having conversations specifically around uh, the detour for the coming season. Uh, for much of the season, the bike path between College Street and Maple Street will be closed. Uh, so we'll have more information for you soon on that. Um, and I'm pleased to report that uh, Bike Share, uh, which has been operated as Green Ride with pedal bikes, about 100 bikes in South Burlington, Winooski, and Burlington, is about to be expanded. And uh, in the next week, 
Uh, we should expect to double the size of the fleet and have it transition to all electric uh, bicycles. So uh, more information forthcoming on that. So uh, busy, busy season here. Um, I thank you for recognizing all the contributions of staff on these big items tonight. Water Resources has done an amazing job on the, the water uh, uh, restructuring and consolidated collection is a, is a major lift and a consideration of really a, a new way of, of collecting uh, our waste streams in our city. And we're proud to be part of that uh, and trying to keep track of all the existing uh, operational tasks as we go. So thank you. I should also maybe let you know that uh, we've had a bit of a transition that's senior engineer Susan Molzon, who's been uh, uh, at these committee meetings a fair bit in the past, is uh, relocating back to her hometown and uh, will be leaving us uh, in about a week. And so uh, we're going to be a little short staffed in tech services over the next couple of weeks. Uh, so give us a little bit of patience as we uh, uh, staff back up. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Director Spencer. Um, we will close that item and go to counselor updates. Um, counselor Barlow, any qu questions? You know, this, this is a time in the agenda where I often, no, we, we all often, but I've, I've been the main one that's done it is we sometimes ask director Spencer, um, you know, for questions on items of interest, or if we have items that we want to raise, um, at a future meeting or understand more about this is kind of an open time for counselors to ask questions or share thoughts you don't have to but um i'd like to take advantage of it um, so feel free if I'd, be, any I'd be happy to actually um I, I, director spencer i had asked you about um that piece of uh property at the end of van Patten parkway that constituents wanted to um potentially use and i was wondering if um, if there was any update on that. And just for the public and for Councilor Hansen, there's a piece of unused um, property that is, I believe, uh, part of, it's unused as part of an agreement with the state of Vermont or something and part of the 127 con, Route 127 construction. But um, neighborhood uh, residents want to use it as a green space for a picnic, a picnic area and just a, just a quiet, small little park space. So. Yes, thank you. It's been a, a, a good conversation, an interesting idea. I always enjoy getting uh, creative ideas from constituents and residents. Um, this one is largely being uh, led by parks and I have not gotten a recent update from them. Uh, they're looking at uh, whether they can maintain it, what it would cost to move the fence. Uh, we are on our end looking for the finance and maintenance agreement for the Route 127 Beltline as uh, the fence uh, that would need to be moved was installed uh, to protect the public from the limited access highway. Uh, so uh, we're, we're digging that out. Uh, it's, it's on our list. It's not at the top of the list to be honest, given uh, the operational needs of the spring, but we will get to it and follow up with the, the residents. Understandable for that update. Great, thanks. Anything else, Councilor Barlow? Uh, nothing other than I'm uh, excited to serve on this committee. This is one of the ones that I've um, had a keen interest in. So I, I welcome the opportunity and look forward to working with uh, Councillor Hansen and Stromberg and, and, and the folks at DPW. Great. Yeah, we're excited to have you. I'm excited to transition into the chair role. And we do actually, normally this is the last item, um, Councillor Barlow, but we do have one other item just to talk about the committee priorities going forward. Um, Director Spencer, go ahead. Yeah, I, I forgot one update that I oh, was yeah. important I provide. So if you'd Great. indulge me, yeah, uh, which is that uh, one item that we would like to bring uh, to the council is an update on the new streets uh, surrounding uh, City Place Burlington, the new blocks of Pine and St. Paul. Uh, we were hoping that in working with uh, City Place Burlington that we'd be ready tonight to, to show uh, those plans. Uh, not quite ready yet and given the full agenda tonight, uh, the plan at this point, given that we're gonna miss this meeting would be to aim for the council, full council meeting on May 10th. 
so that it would be in advance of any escrow closing or uh, transfer of, of the parcels uh, for those new streets. So just want to let you know that that's coming and uh, we're excited to uh, come to the council with City Place to talk about those and uh, plan to see that on the 10th. Great. Sounds good. It's going to be a, oh, I'm getting some echo. I think, I don't know. Um, that's going to be a packed meeting on the 10th, I think. Um, so I'm sure you'll work with President Tracy to negotiate mm -hmm. that. Um, it's going to be a very busy one. Um, so, all right. So that closes out or counselor up or counselor updates. I guess I'll do my just normal asking about, um, um, bike lane projects and see if I know we discussed recently director Spencer, but just any updates you could provide on Winooski Avenue and Colchester Avenue. Um, if there's been any updates recently or changes to the timeline. Great. Um, uh, so on the spring painting, we have our contract with our, uh, striping, uh, contractor. Uh, they have tentatively given us a date of mid-May for coming to town after clean sweep. So just a week after clean sweep to be able to uh, reinstall uh, all the long line markings in the city, which I know uh, this time of year, there are, some of them are hard to see. So that's good news. Uh, we are uh, looking at for this year for bike uh, up, upgrades, uh, looking at enhancements. A uh, concept of a two-way uh, bike facility on North Champlain Street, connecting the old North End to downtown. Uh, there is a shared use path uh, on Mansfield Avenue that is under design. Uh, and we will be having an upcoming public meeting that would stretch from the old North End Greenway and connect to the shared use path on Colchester Avenue. Uh, so we're excited by that. And um, the parking management plan that you referenced on uh, North Winooski Avenue is underway and thanks for serving on that uh, committee. And um, I have not gotten an update since we last talked about where we stand. And my understanding is that we wanna bring that uh, to a close sometime in the middle of the summer and there's a possibility of installing the fall. I need to check back and get you an update. Great. Great. Yeah. And just Councillor Barlow, you may or may not know this, but the Winooski Avenue corridor study and, and the changes on North Winooski Avenue that are coming up, we have a role in that because there's going to be a joint committee um, to look at the parking management plan. And it's a joint committee of um, us and then some stakeholders from the corridor, this committee plus stakeholders from the corridor. So I'm sure you'll get something in your inbox soon about that joint committee meeting. And I'm hoping that we can keep, keep this item on track and moving because we're, we got significantly delayed by COVID and um, there is sort of an impetus. Well, there's plenty of reasons to, to have urgency or to move quickly, but I think one of the big ones is just the fact that the state is going to be repaving in 2022 is my understanding. And so getting the configuration set ahead of that repaving is pretty important for efficiency's sake of having the state provide the proper layout for the corridor when they do make that investment. Um, Director Spencer, any, did I get anything wrong with that? Uh, no, uh, this is the last we've heard uh, the state is still on for uh, doing most of the repaving of uh, Class one town highways in uh, in the city next year. Um, we're hoping that with COVID and financial impacts uh, that that has not uh, slipped. We have not heard it has to date. And so uh, we'll certainly keep you posted if anything changes. Great. Councillor Barlow, were you about to say something? Sorry. No. Okay. And then Colchester Avenue, that was delayed. It was going to come to the Public Works Commission this month. And so now it's set for May, is that correct? Uh, yes, yes. S certain staff members uh, have needed to uh, uh, take a little time uh, for various reasons and that has affected the, the delivery to the TUC, but uh, we are looking forward to bringing that to you next month. Okay, great. So that'll come to us as well as the Public Works Commission in May? 
Uh, I will confirm that, but that is my understanding, yes. Okay, all right, great. Well, thank you, appreciate that. That was all I had for that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and close down the counselor report item and, and move to our last item for the night, which is um, just kind of a discussion of the committee priorities and looking ahead to this coming year in this committee, what we hope what we hope to accomplish and kind of a structure for the committee. Um, and Councillor Barlow, I guess I can, I can start by just giving you some insight or updating you on some conversation that Director Spencer and I have had um, around this. Um, so we've been meeting on the monthly, on the fourth Tuesday. That's kind of been our schedule. And we can talk about this. What Director Spencer and I had talked about would be to maintain that and keep keep going with that. But then what we discussed was adding in additional special meetings on specific topics that we want to take up that aren't already being taken up. So an example of that is um, an email thread that you were on around solar Res rooftop residential solar in Burlington and trying to reduce barriers to that. Um, that would be an item where we could have a special meeting dedicated to that item. We could bring in stakeholders, learn, discuss, um, and, th and then from there, roll it into a normal meeting. But so to sort of, the idea would be to pepper in these special meetings on large topics that we wanna dive into and have those just scheduled separately from our typical um, fourth Tuesday meetings. So that was just a bit of a high level process wise of what this committee might look like. Um, and then I would love, so I'd love to hear your thoughts on that. And then, and then I'd love to have a, just a conversation to run through some of the items that we might be interested in taking up in this committee over the next year. No, I think that's, um, that's a great idea and I'm supportive of it. Um, so the special meetings would be to they'd be topical in nature as needed to address specific topics. And then the, it would be to collect input. Um, and then we would bring that back to the full to, to process. Is that the thinking on it? Yeah. So the idea that we discussed and I'm open to feedback the idea that we discussed is basically um, it would be informational. So we wouldn't make any decisions at those meetings, but we would be really, it's almost like a hearing as they do in the state house. So bring in relevant stakeholders um, and experts and a diverse group of voices to really learn and gather that input and information, but not to make decisions. And that might be a little bit easier on staff too is if we know we're not making any decisions, it, you know, it doesn't, it does, they don't have to abide by the same, um, the same, they don't have to follow the same protocol, I guess. It's, I think it's a little bit less work in terms of the public notice and everything. Um, but then once we did that, we would look to bring it, you know, at, into a normal meeting and, and try to move forward on policy on that item or decide, or we might decide we're not gonna you know, do anything on it. But these special meetings, the way we envisioned it would just be um, more so a hearing or an informational meeting. I think it's a great idea. I'm fully supportive. Great, that's, that's great to hear. And um, I can talk to Councillor, well, no, I can't really talk to Councillor Stromberg offline because we're a quorum of the committee, but um, I'm sure she'll watch this recording too, and um, we can discuss it at the next meeting. So one, so I'll just flag with you two ideas right now that I already have. So one of them is this solar issue that I'm hoping to schedule a special meeting and working with Maddie. Um, and Maddie, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this too, but um, this would be around, around, the issue of residential rooftop solar and trying to reduce barriers for folks to be able to install solar in Burlington. And the, the thinking would be to do this in June um, and try to bring together relevant stakeholders from the city side and then 
um, from the community and business side as well to, to grapple with this issue. Um, so, and then the other idea that I have um, is around pedestrian safety that I've been discussing with some different constituents and stakeholders would be to do a hearing or a special meeting and improve pedestrian safety in the city. Um, and I'm hoping to do that in May at some point um, and try, try to get that scheduled soon and do that in May. So. Maddie or Mark or Chapin, love to hear your thoughts on those two ideas. I think I've already um, responded to you. I think the solar um, rooftop solar and looking at the barriers and possibly reducing them is something I am supportive of. I've seen some of the email around that. It seems like it's worth exploring. And I know, I know less about um, the pedestrian safety topic, but I know that obviously it's important and I'm, you know, interested in, are you thinking about specifically uh, having a hearing on um, pedestrian safety issues, uh, particular geographic spots that need, um, you know, uh, some sort of remediation or improvement um, or, or just more generally about pedestrian safety? Yeah, actually both. Um, so I have some constituents who have particular concerns and have been gathering data at particular intersections. Um, but I think more broadly, a question of what can the city do to enhance pedestrian safety? Um, not necessarily at specific intersections, but just a, a wider conversation about how we can improve that. Um, and what, what treatments would help, you know, could be helpful or is there a process that we need to set up or change? So I think it would be, yeah, really an exploration of how we could improve in this area. Um, and I actually, just a side note, I saw, I saw a girl almost get hit by a car, a young, a young girl riding her bike across a crosswalk that it, it was a red crosswalk by Roosevelt Park with the with a traffic cone in the middle of it, but the car almost hit her. It, it had to slam on the brakes and it was honking at her. And she was clearly pretty, you know, rattled by it. Um, so that was another reminder of this issue. But um, yeah, that would be, it's it's pretty open-ended at this point, Councilor Barlow. Um, so those are two specific ones. I think there's there's, this topic area of transportation, energy, and utilities, there's a lot there. And so there may be other ideas and I'm certainly welcome ideas from you and Councillor Stromberg and from staff, if there are other issues where we wanna do this hearing format and try to grapple with um, and to take up. There will also be, as there always is, just a steady flow of, of items that come our way through staff. Um, so this would kind of be over and above that, I would say, and maybe more generated from counselors um, because yeah, the stuff from staff is kind of already coming into our normal meetings typically. So I have one that is um, sort of an ongoing one and one that Director Spencer's probably heard about before. Great. But um, in, the, in the far corners of the new North End, um, it's really hard to get, uh, if you live down there, to use bus transportation. So. Um, I know we've talked about it in the past and um, about ways to, you know, get specials and other routes, but just generally getting buses into the sort of um, the less served areas of the city, I think would be something worth exploring. As Great. A topic. Great. Yeah, I'd be very interested in that as well. And I was thinking just for staff sake and, committee members sake is probably trying to probably trying to do at, at most one of these a month. And so um, if we do the pedestrian one in May and the um, solar in June, then we could do that one in July. I'd be certainly open to that. So trying to get people to a public meeting in July is always particularly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. That's true. Well, we, it doesn't have to be July, but um 
Okay. And so then, yeah, let's, let's open it up to just some other topics. Um, I'll run through a list that director Spencer and I had discussed mostly for your benefit, um, counselor Barlow. So there's two item. Well, there's one item that was designated in a council resolution to, to have ongoing work in the two committee, which was around fossil fuel divestment, the city's pension funds, um, um, ending their investments in fossil fuel companies. And there was, as part of that resolution, the TUC was to look at um, potentially ways to invest the money that gets divested to invest that locally. Um, I don't have the language right in front of me, but that's something that I think would therefore be coming to us from that resolution. Um, this issue around rental weatherization that's that we sent back to ordinance committee recently as that's written right now, as it's drafted would be overseen by this committee. Um, I think semi-annually or annually. So that would be an item that would, that'll come to us at some point if, if the, if the ordinance passes, um, the Champlain Parkway and the rail yard enterprise project has lived a lot in this committee. And I imagine we'll continue to, as we keep grappling with that issue, with those issues. Um, and G yeah, green mountain transit issues. Um, I think we'll continue to grapple with, as you just brought up. Um, there was another issue that I had, that I, that's on my radar and I'm, we may take up in this committee around the idea of rail service between um, the South End and downtown between the Hula, having a station near the Hula site. Um, that's been an interest of theirs and some other folks. So that may be a discussion here. Um, yeah, plan BTV, walk, bike, um, issues. So Colchester Avenue, as we discussed, Winooski Avenue, Main Street as well. Um, looking at changes on all three of those corridors. Um, I think there'll be activity here on those items. So those are some of the ones that Director Spencer and I talked about. Um, Director Spencer, are there other items that you wanted to foreshadow for this coming year? Um, no, I, I think, as you pointed out, there are definitely ongoing projects and planning efforts that will come to this committee in due course when they're ready. Um, I think it was a good conversation we had. I'm looking forward to working well with this committee uh, as we uh, look to make our transportation system more resilient and uh, more sustainable. Great. Great. Um, Councillor Barlow, any other issues that you that are of interest to you that you want to just kind of get out there as things that we could maybe look at this coming year? Not at this time, but I will think about it more deeply and, and Great. Uh, share them as they occur to me. Please do. Please do. I definitely hope to make this a very active committee. I think it already it already is just because there's a lot of traffic of items coming through it, but I also want to continue to proactively raise new issues and items. Um, and I encourage um, you and Councillor Stromberg to feel free to do the same. And hopefully we can, we can get a lot done this, this coming year. Um, great. Well, that's, that's really all I've got on that for the time being. Um, any, Further questions or thoughts before we move to adjourn? And Maddie, I don't know if you wanted to share any thoughts on, on the direction of the committee um, from your perspective as well, but I'd love to hear if you do. Um, no, uh, thanks for the chance to give input. Um, I think it's it's a great opportunity for for a special meeting um, additionally if needed. So excited to seeing what you guys come up with. Well, great. And I I think I'll be, yeah, we you and I can probably talk offline, Maddie, about trying to pull together these these first two meetings and trying to get those um, locked down in terms of a date and time. 
Okay. Great, and we're happy to do so. And uh, given the recent staff change, I just wanna make sure that we are sensitive to our staff capacity, but we clearly wanna help make this happen. Uh, Councilor Hansen, and we'll, we'll figure out how to do that. Great, great. Should I be having that conversation directly with Maddie or do you want me to loop you in, Director Spencer, as well? Yeah, why don't, why don't you loop me in just so I can participate, but uh, Maddie's the one who's gonna help make it happen. Okay. Yeah. Great. We really appreciate it. I know that you all are always managing many, many things. Um, and I guess one more thing that I do want to just mention as it relates to that is the capacity, the staffing, the resources of public works, because we are taking on a lot. And I want to make sure that you all have an adequate resources to do that. And so that could be something that we discuss in this committee as well, potentially. All right, well, Councillor Barlow, would you like to make a motion to adjourn? Make a motion that we adjourn. I will second that. Any final discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Great, well, thanks so much, everyone. We're adjourned at 7.35. Have a great night. Thank you. Thanks, thanks